All right, we're going to pick up where we left off, which is example three. And the reason that I separated the lesson is because some wacky things happen in these examples. So when we look at example three, we do our same rules, which is we look and we say, what do I have going on in the equation? I've got variables and numbers on both sides. So I need to get a side for variables and a side for numbers. That stuff is still the same. So let's label variables on one side and numbers on the other. Again, it doesn't matter. I'll go variables on the left and numbers on the right. So I drop a line down the equal sign. I'm following those same steps from the last lesson. And I remember that I told you I always like to move the variables first. So this negative 4x is not on the variable side. It has to move over. So the way that we move it is by using addition because it's already being subtracted. So I'm going to add 4x to make this 4x go to the other side. Now what I do is I line it up over here with its like term, and if you notice, it actually also cancels here because negative 4x plus 4x cancels. Everything goes away. Anything plus its opposite is going to be just a zero. So then when you bring down what's left, you end up with 3 equals negative 7. And then you pause for a second and you say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. Of course, 3 doesn't equal negative 7. So you didn't do anything wrong. That's usually the first thing that kids think is that I must have made a mistake somewhere. Uh, but what happens is that there's actually no answer for this equation. This is like one of those philosophical questions that has no answer. So there's no value for x that when you plug it in would make this equation true. Remember, a solution is a value of the variable that makes the equation equal each other on, on both sides. It makes it equal the same thing. So there's no number that exists that will solve this equation for us. So what we write is we write no solution. And that tells our reader that there's no answer to this equation. Now let's scroll down to example four. So you do your same things. You look at the equation and you say, what do I have going on? I definitely have variables on both sides. I have numbers on both sides. And on this side, you have the distributive property. And not only do you have the distribu distributive property, but you have that F word that you're not allowed to say, which is fractions. Everyone freaks out at fractions. Don't freak out. I got you. So we're going to just distribute uh, first because you want to cancel the grouping symbols first. And I'm going to put the 4 over 1 just to make it friendlier, the other F word, uh, with the fraction. So when I go to distribute, I get 12 over 2x plus 4. 12 over 2 is very simply 6x. So this side, even though it looked super freaky, it just ends up as 6x plus 4. And then I can bring that over on the other side. Now I'm going to follow my same steps. I'll bring my equation up here. 6x plus 4 equals 6x plus 4. Wait a second. That is the exact same thing on both sides. When you have an equation that says the exact same thing on both sides, of course it's equal. Remember, the solution is the value that makes it equal. So they're already equal. So what do you write? What you write is infinite number of solutions. And what that means is like the opposite of what we just had. That means that any number in the entire universe that you plug into this equation is going to make it true. So there's an infinite number of possibilities for this equation. These two examples get kids a little worried because they're used to having a number as an answer and example three and example four style of equations have no number as their answer. All right, let's look at a question that has a number as its answer. Let's look at it inside a geometry question. It tells us that the two circles are identical and they want to know the area. So uh, we're going to pause for a second and think what is the formula for area of a circle? 
the formula for area of a circle is pi r squared, pi times radius squared, the number pi times the radius squared. And remember, to square something means to multiply it by itself. So what we do is we look at our picture and we say, what do we know? Well, the radius of a circle, if you forgot, is half the distance across the circle. It goes from the center to the edge. Um, when you have a situation like this in this purple circle or blue circle, whatever color you want to call it, um, it would be what we call a diameter. So if you look at this circle, that means that the radius, if the, if the diameter is 4x, then the radius is 2x. And then they tell us that the circles are identical, so this representation of 2x must be equal to this representation, representation of x plus 2, because they are the same. So I can go off to the side and I can write an equation that says 2x is equal to x plus 2 because the circles are the same. So now I pick a side for variables and a side for numbers because I look at my equation and I see that I have variables on both sides. So I'll put my variables on the left and my numbers on the right. I always like to move the variables first, in case you never heard me say that. So I'm going to subtract x from the right and move it on to the left. So then I just get 1x or just x and that's equal to 2. But don't circle choice A, that's a trick question, or there's a trick answer, because it's not the answer to the question. The question says, what's the area of the circle? The choice A was put there for people who don't read the question. So we're not going to get tricked, and we're going to now take our value of x, and we're going to use it to find the radius. So I go over to my picture right here, and you can go to either circle. If x is 2, that means that the radius is 4, because 2 plus 2 is 4. So radius is 4. So now I can go and I can plug it into my area formula. So if a is equal to um, pi r squared, whoops, um, I can do that it's pi times 4 squared. 4 squared is not 8. 4 squared is 16 because it's four times itself, and then you can see that it's choice C. Right, that was a little tricky. Let's do another word problem together. Example six. A boat travels X miles per hour upstream on the Mississippi River. On the return trip, the boat travels two miles per hour faster. How far does the boat travel upstream? So you might not have any idea how to start, so they've given us a little hint to start. Use the idea that distance equals rate times time because they tell us it's speed um, and they also tell us the time in the story, three hours and two hours. So even though you might not think that we have enough information to do this, we actually do because d going up is equal to um, x times 3, rate times time. The x is the speed or the rate, and the time was 3, because I got that in the picture. d going down is equal to x plus 2, because it went 2 miles per hour faster, and the speed and the time was 2.5. So I'm going to just distribute a little, simplify. d going up is 3x. d going down is 2.5x plus 5. And one thing that you do know about the distance is when you look at the picture is that the distance going up the river is going to be the same as the distance going down the river. So we know that our distances are going to be equal. Whoa. OMG, I can't believe we just wrote that equation. So now let's solve it. So I'm going to bring my variables to the left. That's my choice. You could bring it to whatever side you want. Um, but I'm always going to move my variables first. 
So I'm going to subtract 2.5x from here. And I get uh, 0.5x is equal to 5. And then I have to divide both sides by 0 0.5. And you get that x is equal to 10. Don't circle it as your answer, right? Remember, some, some of you got tricked in the last question. Let's read it. It says, how far does the boat travel upstream? So this only represents the speed going upstream. We need to know how far it traveled. So it went 10 miles per hour for three hours. So 10 miles per hour for three hours gives us 30 miles. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I'm going to look at examples three and four. That's the foundation of this lesson. If you can get to example three and four, then you're in a good place. If you can do example five, you're in a little bit of a better place. If you can do example six, then you're in a really good place. So I don't want you to freak out if you can't do example six, because the foundation of this lesson is just examples three and four. If you have any questions, write them down and ask me when you come to class.